Romans 10. Now, I continue with the same question from Romans 9. Who is Paul writing to in Romans 9 through 11? Church tradition has Paul writing to Christians, but is that true? We read in Romans 9, verses 3 through 4, that Paul is writing to his brethren, his kinsmen, in the flesh, Israelites. Paul affirms his intended audience here in the first verse of Romans 10. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Romans 10.1 Remember, Paul is writing about Israel. He is not writing about the church, the body of Christ. Paul is writing to the little flock believers in Rome, Jews and proselytes following their Messiah Jesus and considering themselves under the law of Moses. Also, Paul seems to have expanded his audience to include all the Israelites in Rome. Keep this fact in focus. If you try to apply chapters 9 through 11 to us, the church, you will immediately encounter problematic passages that are contrary to us being under grace and possessing eternal life. Greetings. I'm Dr. Paul Felter. Welcome to my video podcast where we expose church fallacies and flawed Christian traditions with Bible truth. We let the Bible speak for itself. If you appreciate the video podcasts, please consider subscribing to my YouTube channel or my podcast channel, both named Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Also, please visit my website, breadoflife.media, for additional resources, including my free PDF chart of your Bible, Rightly Divided. Let's continue with verses 2 through 4. For I bear them record that they have a zeal for God, but not according to knowledge. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. Israel, the Jews, had a passion and fervor for God, but they did not understand how to focus that enthusiasm to properly please God. They were unaware of how to live and thrive in God's righteousness through faith. So they tried to create their own righteousness through the routine repetition of the law of Moses. The performance of the law was their motivation, believing that their rote actions would establish approval with God. Jews were commanded by God to keep the law, but their first priority was to have faith in God. The Apostle John addresses this issue in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, writing to the church at Ephesus. They had left their first love and were more concerned about their works than their faith in Jesus as Messiah. They had faith in their own good works instead of the Lord. Jesus was not at all happy about this problem. In fact, he threatened to remove their assembly if they did not repent and return to him in faith. But Paul states that Jesus Christ is the end of merely keeping the letter of the law to earn favor with God. The proper paradigm is faith. For mankind, it has always been faith. But the heart of man is evil, wanting to participate in his own salvation by performing good works. How many times have you heard it said, well, I'm a good person. Really? By whose standards? God's? I think not. Paul had previously stated this in chapter 9, verse 32. Wherefore, because they sought it not by faith, but, as it were, by the works of the law. Romans 9, 32. Mankind must always approach God by faith, for without faith it is impossible to please God. For Moses describes the righteousness which is of the law, that a man which doeth these things shall live by them. But the righteousness which is of faith speaketh on this wise, Say not in thine heart, Who shall ascend up into heaven, that is, to bring Christ down from above? Or who shall descend into the deep, that is, to bring Christ up again from the dead? But what saith it? The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth 
in thine heart, that is, the word of faith, which we preach, Romans 10, 5-8. Paul states that to earn righteousness via keeping the law, then one must live by the law and keep every part of the law, which no one could ever do except Jesus. So for man to be righteous before a holy God, there must be another way, and that way is by faith. But righteousness by faith is not hidden or out of man's reach. Paul then quotes Deuteronomy chapter 30. For this commandment, which I commanded thee this day, is not hidden from thee, neither is it afar off. It is not in heaven that thou shouldest say, Who shall go up for us to heaven, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it, and do it? Neither is it beyond the sea, which thou shouldst say, Who shall go over the sea for us, and bring it unto us, that we may hear it, and do it? But the word is very nigh unto thee, in thy mouth, in thy heart, that thou mayest do it. Deuteronomy 30, 11-14 Paul is telling the Jews in Rome, who are very much accustomed to keeping the law, not to fret over the impossibility of attaining justification by works of the law, as if to fearfully say, If I could just find someone to ascend up to heaven and bring Christ down to give us the words of faith, there might be some hope. But since that cannot be done, my state is altogether a desperate one. Another impossible case would be to ascend into the deep to bring Christ up from the dead to hear the words of faith. This is obviously a rhetorical statement, as Christ had already risen from the dead. Paul is painting a picture that searching for the word of faith from the heights of heaven to the depths of the sea and the underworld is a futile endeavor. Why is that? Because the word of faith is in our very mouth, in our heart, planted in every person by God. We simply must believe it and exercise it. And how was that to be done? By the Jews in Rome and elsewhere? By following Paul's command in the next verse. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Romans 10, 9-10 What does it mean to confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus? Confess what? Obviously the confession must be made out loud. But exactly what is to be confessed? I'm going to list several verses from the Old Testament to show you what that means. See now that I, even I, am he, and there is no God with me. Deuteronomy 32, 39. Ye are my witnesses, saith the Lord, and my servant, whom I have chosen, that ye may know and believe me, and understand that I am he. Before me there was no God formed neither shall there be after me. Isaiah 43.10 Yea, before the day was, I am he, and there is none that can deliver out of my hands. Isaiah 43.13 I, even I, am he that blotteth out thy transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember thy sins. Isaiah 43.25 Hearken unto me, O Jacob and Israel, my called, I am he. I am the first, and I am the last. Isaiah 48, 12. I, even I, am he that comforteth you. Isaiah 51, 12. Now from the New Testament. I say therefore unto you, that ye shall die in your sin, if ye believe not that I am he. Ye shall die in your sins. John 8, 24. Now I tell you, before it come, that when it is come to pass, ye may believe that I am he. John 13, 19. From the Old Testament, the phrase I am he refers to God, the Savior and Redeemer of Israel, the Lord of hosts, the King and Messiah. Any Jew worth his weight in Dead Sea salt would know that Jesus proclaims in the New Testament that unless Israel believes that he is the I am he, they will die in their sins, meaning they will be condemned to hell forever. So when Paul writes, If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, 
he is clearly stating that a Jew must believe that Jesus Christ is God, their Savior and Redeemer, their Lord of hosts, their King and Messiah. Without this belief, they cannot be saved. Also, it was common knowledge that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified on a Roman cross. Obviously, if Jesus Christ is God, he cannot remain in the grave. They must also believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead. They must confess that Jesus Christ is God and that he is risen from the dead. Then thou shalt be saved. That is a salvation gospel specifically for Israel, as there is no mention of Jesus dying on the cross for our sin. How could Paul leave this essentially fundamental pillar of salvation by grace out of the equation if his intended audience was everyone? He could not, of course, since Israel has been set aside during this present dispensation of grace. The primary application of this passage will be for Israel enduring the seven-year tribulation. Paul then adds that with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made to salvation. A requirement of verbal confession was not part of the gospel of grace, and Paul never required that of any Gentile. Yet another clue that Paul's intended audience for these chapters is the Jews in Rome. For the scripture saith, Whosoever shall believe on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between Jew and Greek, for the same Lord over all is rich unto all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10, 11 through 13. Whosoever believes in the Lord will not be ashamed of their belief when they either enter the kingdom for Israel or heavenly places for the body of Christ. We will not be ashamed of our faith as that is what saved us and restored our fellowship with the Father. Whosoever now includes both Jew and Gentile. Paul is the first person in your Bible to make such a statement. Jesus' twelve apostles always made a distinction between Jews and Gentiles as written in the Gospels. See Matthew chapter 15 about the Canaanite woman. Paul declares that there is now no difference between Jew and Gentile, for God is the God of all. This is a startling statement because for over a millennium, the Jews had nothing to do with the Gentiles, as shown in the following two verses. But against any of the children of Israel shall not a dog move his tongue against man or beast, that ye may know how the Lord doth put a difference between the Egyptians and Israel. Exodus 11, 7. And ye shall be holy unto me, for I the Lord am holy, and have severed you from other people, that ye should be mine. Leviticus 20:26. But Paul had the audacity to change the God-ordained separation of Jew and Gentile paradigm. Why? Because Jesus told him to. Jesus was establishing the dispensation of grace through the Apostle Paul, and now everyone is included. No exceptions and no favored peoples or nations. Grace is the new paradigm, not the law of Moses. And grace is given to whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord. How do you call upon his name? You do what Paul commanded in the following verses. Moreover, brethren, I declare unto you the gospel, which I preached unto you, which also ye have received, wherein ye stand, by which also ye are saved, if ye keep in memory that which I preached unto you, unless ye have believed in vain. For I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. 1 Corinthians 15, 1-4 To call upon the name of the Lord in this present dispensation of grace, you must believe and trust that Jesus Christ died on the cross for your sin, was buried, and rose from the dead on the third day. That belief and trust will save your soul, and establish fellowship with the Father. I call this the DBR Gospel, the Death, Burial, and Resurrection Gospel of Grace. Paul declares in Romans 10, 13, 
For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. What does it mean to call upon the name of the Lord? Moses writes in Genesis the following. And to Seth, to him also, there was born a son, and he called his name Enos. Then man began to call upon the name of the Lord. Genesis 4.26 Seth was born to Adam and Eve after the murder of Abel. Seth had a son named Enos, and after his birth, men began to call on the name of the Lord. Well, what was the name of the Lord back then? Well, here is a short list. El Shaddai, the Lord God Almighty. El Elyon, the Most High God. Adonai, Lord and Master. Yahweh, Lord Jehovah. Jehovah Nisi, the Lord my banner. Jehovah Ra, the Lord my shepherd. Jehovah Rapha, the Lord that heals. Jehovah Shema, the Lord is there. Jehovah Sidiku, the Lord is our righteousness. El Olam, the everlasting God. Elohim, God. Jehovah Jireh, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Shalom, the Lord is peace. Jehovah Sabbath, the Lord of hosts. People called on these names depending on what attribute of the Lord they were praising. But that was then. What about now? Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. 1 Corinthians 1 2. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. 1 Corinthians 6 11. Giving thanks always for all things unto God and our Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5 20. That at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth. Philippians 2.10 And whatsoever ye do, in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God and the Father by Him. Colossians 3.17 And this is the commandment, that we should believe on the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as He gave us commandment. 1 John 3.23 there is a new name in town. Under the law of Moses, the Old Testament names of God were sufficient for mankind. But now, in this present dispensation of grace, we have a new name, a name through which that grace flows. The new name is Jesus Christ. Put yourself back in the days of the apostles after the ascension of Jesus Christ. Peter and John are not preaching using the Old Testament names of God. They are preaching in the name of Jesus Christ and causing quite a stir, as seen in the following verses. Be it known unto you all, and to all the people of Israel, that by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other. For there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby ye must be saved. Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John, they perceived that they were unlearned and ignorant men. They marveled, and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. And they called them and commanded them not to speak at all nor teach in the name of Jesus. Acts 4, 10-13, and verse 18. Peter and John are preaching and healing in the name of Jesus Christ. The name of Jesus Christ is not a name added to the list of Old Testament names of God. It is a new name that replaces all the Old Testament names of God. The name of Jesus Christ is now the only name recognized by the Father, as Peter states, there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him whom they have not heard? 
And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach except they be sent? As it is written, How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel of peace and bring glad tidings and good things. Romans 10, 14-15 Paul is describing himself. He was sent by Jesus to preach the gospel of peace, the gospel of grace. Many heard him preach the words of grace in Jesus Christ. Some that heard him also believed and were saved. But they have not all obeyed the gospel. For Isaiah said, Lord, who hath believed our report? So then faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Romans 10, 16-17 But many that heard the gospel did not obey the gospel and come to the Lord in faith. Paul then quotes Isaiah asking who believed our report of what God said. So the conclusion is that faith comes through hearing the word of God. There is power in the spoken word. We are affected by the spoken words of others every day. So it is with the spoken word of God. It is more powerful than the spoken words of men, as it alone enhances our faith to believe and be saved. But I say, did not Israel know? First Moses said, I will provoke you to jealousy by them that are of no people, and by a foolish nation I will anger you. Romans 10, 18-19 Paul states that the word of God spoken by Isaiah and the other prophets went throughout the earth. All Israel heard the word of God spoken through the prophets, but they did not listen with their heart leading to faith. So God has provoked the Jews to jealousy by setting them aside and turning to the Gentiles in this dispensation of grace. We are certainly a foolish nation, as God has chosen us by grace through faith and not election. But Isaiah is very bold, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that ask not after me. But to Israel he saith, All day long I have stretched forth mine hands unto a disobedient and gainsaying people. Romans 10, 20-21 God has found millions of Gentiles by grace that perhaps knew very little or nothing of the Old Testament law but simply cried out to him in desperation, and were saved. But his own people Israel, he continually stretched forth his hands, beckoning them to come to him, but they refused. They were rebellious, being in continual opposition to God and his law. Thank God we are under grace. Now an integral part of understanding your Bible is to see God's timeline from Genesis to Revelation in chart format. I have two such works available in print and PDF. The first is a free, rightly dividing the word of truth chart in landscape format. This chart displays God's timeline from Genesis to Revelation. It alone is a tremendous help in understanding the Bible and can easily be downloaded from my website. Second, a letter-sized booklet named The Master Key to Understanding the Bible. This 44-page guide is full color and professionally printed through Lightning Source. It has 13 large, full-color charts displaying the right division concept in great detail. The guide covers the same material as the podcast and is a must-have companion for this serious student of the Bible. The Master Key is also available in audiobook format on Amazon Audible. Both are available on my website, breadoflife.media. Well, that concludes our discussion here on Romans 10. If you have enjoyed this video podcast, then please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel and my podcast channel, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. Well, thanks for joining me today, and next time, see you in Romans 11. God bless. And whatsoever ye do in word or do, or do, 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 (laughs) I'll leave that in just for grins. And whatsoever ye do in word or deed, do it all.